hope you enjoyed the coffee break and I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk from uh, by Nico on uh, Progressive Web Apps. I'm going to, to touch a little bit on this, but I want to focus much more on the broader aspect of, uh, of this project that we've been doing. So what happens when you put a group of uh, technology enthusiasts, enthusiasts on a mountain with the task to figure out how to get a forecast out of the box? And so their mission is then to experiment with technologies, um, to self-organize, to organize themselves, and um, set up the project in such a way that we have a product at the end that we could demonstrate and use. Um, and I'd like to take you in this talk through that journey, um, showing you how we as a community worked together to accomplish this goal. So my name is Dieter, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I live in Switzerland and I work as a developer and architect at Adney in Zurich. Um, the project is about this dust measurement network. When we talk about dust, we actually talk about air particles. Not necessarily dust, as you know, that is lying on the ground. It could be some different kinds of particles, different kinds of chemicals. And the project, the idea of our project was to build a, an application for end users which they could use to monitor and predict pollution, uh, pollution levels. Um, and we would use that, we would do the prediction using machine learning, and we will collect these, uh, the, the pollution levels using IoT devices that we connect to our cloud network. Um, because it's a, it's a um, grassroots community, we'll have to self-organize ourselves, we have to define the roles, we have to identify what technologies are required, which ones we want to choose, which ones we want to pursue. Um, and I'll talk you through this in this talk. So the idea, as I said, um, what happened there? <laughs> Somebody came up with the idea, like, hey, let's build a fully functional application or product that we can use to uh, predict air quality or air pollution. And us as technologists, we wanted this to be um, as open as possible. We wanted to use open, open software. We wanted to share our data with the world, with communities, or within, with society. Um, of course, it should use sensors. We have to collect this information. And we want to distribute that information to individuals so that it's beneficial. Um, we could use this in everyday life to, for example, decide um, whether we take the car or the bicycle, for example. Now, this is a very big idea. Like, how do we get from a product to this idea? And I'll explain that. I'll walk you through this process as how we approached. Um, the development, or even the, 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 also the, okay, the project leadership um, of this of this project. I'm going to touch on every aspect here, but I'm not going to go into very technical detail. I could, but it will take the whole day, and I only have an hour, and you also probably have questions. Um, so I'm going to touch on, like, I'm going to touch the surface, scratch the surface of these individual topics. I'm definitely going to talk about technologies, but I'd rather not give you an overview of how we approach this. So we have this idea and we need to just define what actually we want to do. And so we decided to organize um, an ideation workshop where we would define what is, the, what is the product, what is our vision of what we want to build. From that product vision, we would create an, a minimal value product or MVP that defines what actually we want to accomplish within that first iteration. We we'll self-organize ourselves and we design, we'll design an architecture then go to the actual development, so the hands-on productivity, which I, I as a developer really love, because we know that other stuff is preparation for me, because it's about the architecture and development, of course also showing the results. Um, we'll integrate all the individual components, and then in the end, hopefully, we have done. So that's, that was our roadmap. So how do 
coming at from this idea to, to a product vision. Uh, so we, we decided to en enlist our innovation experts at Ernie. Um, these people are well and very, um, very well at organizing and at brainstorming. Um, they help you, they guide you into the direction of um, what you'd like to accomplish. Um, and there, um, yeah, we did a lot of brainstorming about, so what do we actually want to build? Um, and so what kind of vision do we want to build? What is this product that we actually want to have? What is this forecast that we want to provide to users? Lots of brainstorming, lots of wild ideas, going back, left and right, back and forth. Um, way too many ideas to even write down here on the sheet. There's, there's already met too many here. But in essence, it goes, it goes to, we want to be able to monitor air pollution. Um, and we want to have that information live, somewhere available to the user. Um, we would probably also want to see the evolution of pollution over time. So we want to have sort of a time machine. When you're in a window, you can see how what the pollution at a particular location was. We want to be able to compare locations, for example, and correlate that to other sources, for example, traffic data, or how the weather was, um, all these things. Of course, we need a sensor, we need to collect this information. We could use sensors that are already out there. Um, we can benefit from those, but I think we thought it would be cool to create our own, and so that's how we decided. Um, these are sensors that are out in the field. They are doing remote sensing. We need to send the data to to the application, so we have to, we, we need to have the cloud that combines all that information together and provides it to the, to the, um, the web app. Um, we want to use AI, machine learning, for the prediction. Um, and here it's mostly about we want to provide early warning systems or, or SMS warnings to users that, that subscribe to this service. Or help it with the route planning, if you, for example, cycle and you don't want to go through the polluted areas. Um, visualization, so UX, user experience, experience is very important here. We want to have, give users a, um, a fun experience, a good experience. And so it's important here that we use clear visualization. It needs to be a responsive web app, so it's easily usable also on a mobile phone. So we don't have to develop the UI twice or thrice. Um, important here also, like I said in the beginning, is that we want to contribute to the, to society. We want to the, the, um, the data that we collect and the forecasting that we that we calculate. We would like to share that with individuals or or with, with communities, with developers, but also for for let's say regular people. And so we'd like to have an open API that people can use, can consume to build their apps or to, to use that. Um, but we also want people to do their own analytics if they're interested in this topic, so they could collect the raw data from us to do to, do it, to work in a citizen science project, for example. So not official science, as in not only science like universities, but rather by individuals themselves or communities themselves. And lastly, we'd like to. I mean, it would be cool if we could use this application also for uh, ISO certification. Companies oftentimes have a requirement that they need to be environmental friendly. And this ISO of 14,000 helps them with that definition. So they need somehow to be able to measure the, um, the, the combustion output of, of factories, for example, and this, this network could help them with this. Lastly, security, of course, an important aspect that is usually, well, shouldn't be neglected, but is often a bit neglected. It's also why it's at the end. It's not the most exciting topic for most. Uh, but it's important here that we, not all the information should be public. We have to be careful about what we share and what we don't share. As I said, pollution levels, factories might be sensitive information that we don't, shouldn't go immediately out to the public. Um, and there's also another aspect to it, and that is remote control. These devices that we want to build, they're out in the open somewhere. And they are fire hazard. They have batteries, they could, uh, they could ignite. Like, like the, the fear is on the airplanes when you bring your mobile phone or your, your battery charger with you. Um, the same issue applies in the field. If you leave it somewhere unattended, it, uh, 
that might uh, catch fire, that will be an issue for us. And so we have to, to, to take that into account as well. So that's the product vision. Long story, way too much to do in a small community project. And so we have to narrow this down and, um, and come to, to a, a minimum value project. Um, how do we accomplish this? So our innovation experts helped us as they brainstormed with us. Let's focus on one person and one type of user that we would want to um, serve, that we would want, that we see as, as our, um, our best example for, for somebody to use our product. So we identified that this is going to be John Doe, <laughs> the typical, like ordinary person, but a John Doe that does sports. This John Doe is interested in going running after studying or after work or on the weekends and he doesn't want any when you do intense sports your, your lungs open up and you, your intake is much higher than usual and so pollution in that during that time really matters and so we thought that um, especially for a, a, a sporty John though, this would be very interesting because we could help him Planning his sports regime, planning his routes um, by showing, by predicting pollution forecasts, or by predicting pollution and showing forecasts. And so we came to our MVP. We want to have an independent remote sensor, like a, a device that collects these, these pollutant levels, which connects to our cloud. And we use here, we decided we use water on here. Explain that in a bit, um, which connects through a ThingsNet network to our cloud. We want to be able to monitor that information that comes in. Um, you, you want to visualize that on the map. With that information, we'd like to combine it with weather data to predict for uh, so pre to predict pollution levels the next day or the next following days, and provide that information through a responsive website. So that, in essence, is the scope of the project. We decided to pursue in this stage. So, and that's also the scope what I'm going to tell you about here now in the, the remaining slides. So, before we start, we need to decide how we going to organize ourselves. So, we have a group of people, a group of enthusiasts from different backgrounds. Some are hardware technologists, some are industrial designers, some people are, are more project leaders and managers, or even from sales. There's a lot of developers, of course, people with the UX experience, how do we manage ourselves so that this would work efficiently? So we decided we're going to follow a self-organization organizational approach, holocratic, in the sense that we just identified the, the groups that were necessary to build uh, this product. And what, was, what skills are required um, for those groups? People then could decide for themselves to work in a particular group. They didn't have to have the skills. This is not just about building a product, this is also about learning new skills. And so if you are, for example, a UX specialist, but you wanted to do more development, you could do that. You could be a member of a development group. Of course, there needed to be, there needed to be leadership within the group. There needed to be sufficient skills in order to actually build something, because um, otherwise you won't get anywhere. But this is how we organize this up. We divide the groups and people divide, decided for themselves where to attribute. Um, and this worked really well. It naturally, uh, it naturally grew. Um, there was a sense of responsibility and commitment. People ensured that there was a sufficient uh, level of skill in, uh, in each of the groups. Um, and the communication between the teams was fluent. As in, there was no central organization that directed communication lines. No, people just talked to other people when, whenever it was necessary. And for such a scale, we talk about a community of 30 people here in total, not full-time, but 30 people that contributed to this project across multiple countries. Um, and this worked very well. And then, of course, in this letter we have our um, repository where we, uh, where we all put our, 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 um, our work in. So this is how it looks like, and this is how we set ourselves up.
before I'm going to show you the technical aspects, let's go a little bit into the theory. What is actually pollution? What is particle pollution? We're actually talking here about particle matter, which is shortened to PM. And it's a mixture of airborne solid and liquid um, droplets or you know, particles um, that reside in the air, so they're, like I said, they're airborne. And they, they, they come from various sources. They can be, be actual dust from roads, for example. They could come from combustion sources like factories, cars. Um, also, forest fires are a typical source. Um, in Africa, for example, when people, where people still cook on, on wood or coal, you see also a lot of air pollution. This is a different source than we see here, but it's the same. Um, and pollution is heavily influenced by two aspects, weather and terrain. So, on a hot, humid day, um, when there is no wind, the particles stay in one place, and they just stay in the air. And you see that, for example, here in the picture in Paris, you know, the summer, where lots of smog um, caused by all these particles in the air, because it is a hot summer day and there is no wind. Um, terrain is an inf has an influence because when particles are in the air, um, it, it matters what the temperature differentiation is. And so, for example, if you have, especially in winter, when you have a valley like in Zurich, um, there, in, there's often a temperature inversion, which means it's colder on the ground than it's in the air, higher up in the air, like a kilometer up in the air. Which this makes for the particles to stay below the temperature inversion level, which means that they stay in the valley and they don't move out. You see that with fog a lot as well, which is not the same effect, but similar. Um, but the same for, the, for, for these dust particles. And so, Terrain makes a lot of difference. It also guides the airflow, right? Um, which usually in valleys there's quite a bit of wind, but it really depends on the direction and, and the layout of the valley. When we talk about our health, we're primarily concerned with the two smallest particles, or two smallest groups of particles here: the soot particle and the, uh, the dust particle. The dust, the dust particle is comes from uh, which is called PM10 which is 10 millimeter in size, which is about a fifth of a human hair. They come from combustion sources and are the main contributor to the pollution here in the Western world. Right? And the other particle comes from more, that's much finer. They come from, from, from fires and from um, cooking like in Africa. But you have also have it here because of course we also have forest fires here, um, or just regular fires. And so the PM2.5 and PM10 particle is, or the groups are, are what we're concerned with, and this is what we want to measure and also predict. So with that theory in mind, how do we, what, how do we create our, our application? How do we create our, our product? And so what we need is a sensor on the very left um, that collects these air particles. We connect that to our backend through what is called the Things Network which is an IoT network that helps us manage and control the data flow um, from the device to the cloud. So this is more or less out of the box. It's easy to use. We don't have to create it ourselves. Um, the backend uses um, open weather data um, and combines that with the, the, the sensor data and, pro and provides that to the predictor to, to make its forecasts. And then the web app displays that information on a, on a, on a map and provides that to the user. This is the overall scheme of how we, would, how we envision our product to be. So let's dive now into these individual components and see what we actually did, how we, how we created these. The sensor network, so like I said before, we needed a sensor that, um, that collects these two groups of air po uh, pollution particles, the 2.5 and the 10 uh, micrometer. That sensor is connected to a microcontroller, which we programmed with uh, using the Arduino uh, platform. Um, and so that we can control the sensor, we can control that information, and we can control how we send it. We used LoRaWAN, which is a low energy, long range.
range and low bandwidth radio technology um, broadcasting system. It's basically a run, like a wide area network, but using um, low frequency radio waves. This allows us to send the data up to 10 kilometers. And so we could have our sensor somewhere in the woods or on the road and have it send that information through using LoRaWAN to our cloud. Um, we'll have the Things Network, which contains a gateway that collects this, uh, collects this, collects this data that comes in through the, these radio frequencies um, and forwards that, it's, it's more like a broker, it forwards it to the cloud. And we store that in a, in a, a cloud service that we host in the Docker container um, that's built upon the tick stack. And the tick stack is like a, it's a combination of different components. Here we are primarily interested in using the influx DB, which is a time series DB, which is basically collect, uh, receive the information, store it in that, in that database, and it's, a, it's available as a time series. So, we designed it and then we created it. <laughs> you see here the, the sensor, the FCS011 sensor, um, which has a fan, the black thing on top, and it has, I don't have a pointer here, am I? <laughs> um, and it has, a, it has an opening on the bottom left, this gray element there, which is the actual, se uh, the actual sensor, the opening that, that takes in the airflow and then, and then inside the box the, the measurements take place. This sensor is connected through a serial port to the microcontroller, and the microcontroller has this LoRa1 radio on top. Um, it comes with a battery, so we can have an independent, we don't need to hook it up to, to the electricity network. Um, and of course, this, is, this has to be installed outside, we'll have to need some, we need to have some housing. And we decided to create uh, a box for this. Now, we could just create the box by sawing and gluing stuff together, but it would be much more fun if we just use a 3D printer. And so we bought a 3D printer. <laughs> um, which just arrived, I think, like uh, two months ago. Um, we unboxed it and, and put it together um, and basically designed the, um, the box based on the, on the specifications from the hardware team. So this box needed to have uh, an opening for the fan, of course, just to, for the airflow. It needed a, a hole for the sensor on the back top left. And there's a little hole for a uh, for plug to charge the, the battery. Because the battery doesn't last forever, the one we have now, I have to say, runs out in about a month. We are always a bit uh, inefficient, <laughs> but it's still a prototype. Um, and then we printed it using the, the Ultimaker 3D printer. And so this took about, I would say, what's that, eight hours to print altogether. I think we went through two iterations where we did one, made one mistake in the design and we had to do the ones more. Um, but yeah, it's printing dust. <laughs> um, printing the, the, box from, the box from dust. And this is what it looks like in the end. You see the, the, the dust box here and the uh, bundle of hardware on the right. And I actually brought it with me. Um, this is the box, the 3D printed box, and with the hardware inside glued together, taped together. You can have a look at it later at the, um, the lounge, so I'll, I'll leave it there um, if you're interested, just to see the components, and, or maybe just to see the box. This is still experimental, it's not perfect. Um, we have to go through another iteration, I think, to, to, to make this actually workable outside. Um, but the process works. So now with that data available, now that we are able to collect uh, these particles, we can actually start doing our predictions. Um, and we'd like to use machine learning for this. Um, and before we dive a bit into the details here, um, 
let's recap. We need to predict both the 2.5 and 10 micrometer um, particle sizes uh, for a specific location. We decided to just focus on one location rather than um, different locations for two reasons. One, pollution is high when there's no wind, so there shouldn't be much movement of particles from place to place. If there is wind and the particles disperse, they move in, into the upper higher up in the air, I should say. Um, and secondly, we do not want to overcomplicate this. It's an MPP, not a full product, and so let's focus on the essentials here. So we decided, let's, let's do prediction for one specific location based on that information that we got from that location, and let's combine that then with the weather data to see if we can, uh, if that, how that influences our for the weather, we want to use temperature. Like I said, the hot, humid day makes a lot of difference. Um, for that also, therefore, humidity is, an, is important. Winds, speed primarily, direction not so much. Um, it's of course also important to realize what time of day, or what day of the week it is. Again, the weekend there's less traffic, so there's probably less pollution. Um, and the day of the year as well, because weather has a seasonal pattern. Um, it makes a difference whether we talk about winter or summer. Um, we identified that we needed about six months of data for our prediction algorithm to be at least a little bit reliable. Um, and we need to have, uh, we decided that prediction would use a five day window for its observation. So we would look five days in the past to do the predictions for the next, say, two to three days. Now, we do have this. This sensor, this device, but we don't want to wait six months for it to collect data before we can start playing around with, uh, with our AI, with our prediction model. So we decided to go to another source. <laughs> we went to luftdaten.info, which is a, a German initiative. It's a, also a community that, um, that builds these sensors, similar sensors, and it measures the same, same values, the 2.5 and the 10 uh, PM values. Um, and then primarily in Germany, less so in Switzerland, you see a few nodes here, if you look closely around Zurich. So there are a few sensors here that we could use, but primarily it's in Germany. Um, but we went, we had a look and uh, we identified a sensor that in Zurich that we could use for this. Um, and uh, that had sufficient data that goes back a month, oh, uh, sorry, sorry, back six months, um, that is reliable and consistent. So there's no gaps in the data, uh, it doesn't look strange, the measurements look correct. And so we, cons we consider that this as a, as a good source for, for our uh, machine learning data. The weather data we took from the open weather map, this provides, uh, they provide uh, historic data on weather and on, on all aspects that we're interested in, but especially temperature, humidity, wind speed, um, granular enough for us to, uh, to work with. So granularity here is about is once an hour, um, which is also what the sensors, the, the dust sensors provide. And so this is workable. So unfortunately it wasn't free, so we had to purchase this, um, but it's a one-time purchase. Um, shouldn't be, uh, that was not so much an issue. And then we started to build a model. We used uh, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio here. Which is a really quick plug and play environment to do machine learning. You could just drag and drop the individual machine learning components on it. Very easy. <laughs> you still need to know what you're doing, but you don't have to program it yourself. You can just easily, quickly play around with uh, different aspects and just experiment. Um, we split up our data set between, an AD, between a, a train and a test set because with the train set we could validate whether our whether the algorithm was actually correct. And we trained this with a neural network um, with 200 iterations. And the results were okay, but there was one limitation and in, in it, it, there was no possibility to together predict both 2.5 and 10 uh, micrometer particles. So there is no, it doesn't support multi-variant regression. 
um, which is a limitation and which significantly hinder us, hinders us from providing um, true, reliable predictions. Um, and so we decided to move away from the Microsoft Area Machine Learning Studio. It was good, good to try out, but it was not sufficient to produce something, uh, to create something that was usable for a product. So our second attempt was to use Google's, Google's TensorFlow with Keras and SkyTab Learn. And here we created a, um, a multi-layer multi neural network um, with, the, I would say, the standard, um, standard configuration for, for, such a, for such a network. It, uh, I'm not going to go into details here if you're interested. I could give you a bit more background later. Um, so we trained this, again, we did the same thing. We, we split up the data. We iterated that 200 times, um, but this did provide a, a, a two-variable output, right? So this provided um, output that both had 2.5 and, and the, the 10 micrometer uh, particle predictions. So with that reliable predictor available, we could finally create, integrate this into a into an actual product. So to reiterate what we had, we, if you remember the architecture from before, we had the sensor that's connected to the Things network, which acts as a broker that sends that data, that sends the particle data to the cloud. So it sends, so the Things network is actually on the, let's say, internet. Um, it has a gateway that receives these radio frequencies and it forwards that information, it's a broker that forwards that information to our cloud service. And our cloud service is this TTN gateway, which we call, which is implemented with, uh, with Go. And what it does is it actually also, it's just a gateway, it takes that information and stores it in our database. And that database sits in our, in, in our cloud environment. We then created an enhancement service which executes a cron job and pulls uh, well, it identifies whether there is new, new data in the influx DB, or maybe collects a bunch over, over all day, uh, and connects to the Open Weather Map Open API to get the weather data that we need, aggregate that together, and then we store that in our uh, relational database, this PostgreSQL database. The prediction service then takes that data from the PostgreSQL to do forecasting. This is not an on-demand job, this is a scheduled job and you need forecasting once a day, so you schedule it overnight, for example, to collect that information from the, from the database, do our forecasting, so execute our model on the new data that we have, and then store the results back. Um, and then lastly, we have a web API, or web, web UI, or web application, um, that co combines the information, both the historical information from, from the web and the sensor, as well as the prediction values from the, from the, the prediction service and provides that to the user. So everything in this rectangular box here is the cloud. We've hosted this um, on Microsoft Azure. And each of these components, the red and, uh, red and blue ones, um, are actually individual components. They are hosted in a Docker container and they're orchestrated using Kubernetes. So this is also very this is also very scalable. We can easily um, start or, or stop these services. They're independent. So if the gateway goes down, or if the enhancement service goes down, we still have our web UI available. We still have our prediction service available. Although if it doesn't get any, it's not going to compute anything new, but it's still running. And then lastly, we created our website, our progressive web app, that would show this information live on the, on the map. And this was implemented using HTML5 and Angular and TypeScript. Um, and then as a, the back end of the service was uh, implemented in .NET Core. I'll give you a little demo of how this looks. Okay. Let's see if we can start it. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. So 
So here we go, here we are in Rappersville. <laughs> There's no sensor here. I brought it here, but it's not working. It ran out of battery. Our sensor just consumes whatever it wants, and we cannot shut it down. We really have to un uh, unplug it. And we forgot to do this until it ran out of battery. <laughs> um, but we do have a sensor as well in Missouri. And it provides both historic and prediction values for these, um, these dust particle groups. So you see here in green the larger particles from the combustion sources, as well as the values in gray from more like forest fires, etc., or fires, or, or just dust. Um, and the prediction service, based on the information in the weather data, it does its predictions over a few days. And so you see here the effects of the predictions. Um, that have been calculated from, by the service. We also have a few more locations. I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. Um, there we go, a little bit more. So, okay. All right, so we have a few more devices. Uh, we, so we created actually a few more of these boxes, and we shipped them out to our colleagues that were working with us on this project. Um, so we have a team sitting in uh, Balaclava, for example, that are actually working on this. We have a team in Romania and we have people in Spain, um, all part of Fernie. Um, and they have these boxes running as well. I'm not sure whether these are this, that information is live. Uh, let me check. Um, this is how it looks like. And, and you, can, you can visualize on the map indicating what, how the pollution levels are. I think if we look at Switzerland, for example, if we go back, zoom in, we have also have Lucerne. Lucerne looks a bit better. It's not as polluted as Zurich, which makes sense because it's smaller and it's closer to the mountains. Um, you would expect the air quality to be a bit better there. Right. Um, just to wrap up, because this is the technical part. So I'd like to give you a little feel of the community uh, itself. So what we did was, so we came together as a, as a group of people. Um, that wanted to work on this cool project, and um, it would also be, be great, of course, if you could just meet in person and work closely together, because that's much more efficient, usually, right? and also just much more fun. Right? So, we organized a Hack and Hike, which is a weekend event in the Swiss mountains near Visiflu, uh, near, um, I don't know, near Lake Lucerne, not so far away from here, um, where we just stayed at a mountain hut. Um, we brought our own uh, router with us, so we had internet, a 4G router, uh, and worked together. Um, colleagues from Bratislava drove, our, drove all the way to Switzerland as well, so they drove the whole day to meet us, to join us on this project. Um, yeah, and I mean, it, was, it was just a great event. It was, Nice to network, nice to be together, work together, exchange ideas. Um, really helpful in a, a self-organized environment where there are individual people, individual teams, and communication just happens as, as required, right? So you see here, part of the team is at the end of the, of the event when it was again sunny and we could enjoy the weather. We also hiked a bit, but it was, as you saw um, previous slide, cloudy, <laughs> even rainy. Actually, the day before, it was raining so much, I was completely soaked <laughs> when I arrived. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's, great. it's great to just be in the fresh air and, 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 uh, and work on such a project. And I want to part with you just to show you, give you a bit more experience on this by just playing a video of that event. Let's see. And I hope the sound works. So I've been involved in Hack and Hike for the last four years and I'm really impressed by the energy everybody gives to this, to this project. Uh, this time we're doing a, a dust measurement network with machine learning, lots of different technologies. I'm not a, a programmer myself but I sometimes like getting my hands dirty doing some coding 
uh, so it was a really good opportunity to, to learn about new, new coding things. <laughs> Du warst noch nie an einem Hack and Hike, gewesen, kann ich dir wärmstens empfehlen, auch mal teilzunehmen. Spannende Diskussionen zu technischen Details, dazwischen wieder zu wandern, noch ein gutes Essen. Äh, ja, ich würde mich sehr freuen, dich da mal dafür zu begrüßen und mit dir in Teil zu verbringen. Ähm With that, I like to part. Um, we have our um, our work online at the GitHub repository under the link. So if you're interested, just come to me afterwards and ask uh, if maybe you can have a look or contribute. We'd be happy to have people working with us to actually push this forward. It's still, because the product is, but the, the application is not yet a product, it's still a prototype. <laughs> um, we have, it's working, the, the parts are, the moving parts are working. Um, but it needs to be polished in order to finish. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for, for listening. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, you can ask them at the lounge where I'll be, or during the lunch break, or coffee break, or something.